Hello, I'm John Scott. I'm the director, founder of Irish Modern Dance Theatre, and you're very welcome to our festival, Dancer from the Dance Festival of Irish Choreography. Dancer from the Dance is a gathering of 32 Irish and Irish identifying choreographers from Ireland and the USA. And it crosses national borders, practices, ethnicities, and generations. I'm very, very happy. This is our second edition of the festival. It's a festival that exists in both New York and in Dublin. We were potentially frustrated with the festival this year in realizing it due to the situations around the coronavirus pandemic. But um, we, Greta Burke, um, my manager and myself and all our partners and all the choreographers have been in close dialogue and work together to realize the festival despite any obstacles. And I think it's a testament to the unity of the Irish dance community and our determination to keep going no matter what. And we're very, very excited. It's a total of 19 events over five days. There are performances, um, screen dance, uh, classes, workshops, and also now tonight's panel talk. Uh, which I'm very, very excited about. And I'm very, very happy to welcome our panelists. Um, but before then, um, we couldn't do this without the support of our sponsors, uh, the Arts Council of Ireland, Culture Ireland, Dublin City Council, News Talk FM, and our partners, Dance Ireland, the Irish Arts Centre, Dance Limerick, Centre Culturel Irlandais, and Project Arts Centre. So now, um, one of the things that was very, very important in making the festival in 2019 and in 2020 is our close relationship with our friends in New York, the more than friends, our family, our colleagues, the Irish Arts Centre. And I'd now like to introduce Aidan Connolly, director of the Irish Arts Centre, to say a few words um, of welcome and to tell us about the exciting developments happening in Irish Arts Centre which is going to be a home for the entire Irish artistic community, a home from home, from Ireland to New York. Thank you, Aidan. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, as John said, uh, I'm Aidan Connolly, director of Irish Arts Center. Greetings from New York City. I'm here uh, live from the construction site of the new Irish Arts Center, um, which uh, will be an international cultural home, multidisciplinary home here in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Irish Art Center has been around since 1972, uh, but really over the last decade, um, including an important conversation that we had with someone named John Scott just around the corner from here, uh, a beautiful little French cafe, as part of our artistic consultative process to reimagine what an Irish Art Center might be in New York City. What exactly does that mean? Um, and so we are, we are coming. Uh, more than hundreds of interviews and millions of dollars and one global pandemic later, towards the finish line of that project. And what you see behind me um, is the fruits of that uh, creativity and that labor. Indeed, you see some of our wonderful construction team uh, working at safe social distances with appropriate PPE to help us realize that dream. And so uh, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to be a part of Dancer from the Dance and to continue uh, our dialogue uh, with the artistic community, with the dance community uh, in Ireland uh, and here in New York and, and across the country. Uh, so we thought it would be fun to just give you a glimpse of construction, sort of where things stand. I think we'll have an opportunity to get into a little bit more detail at another time in the festival, um, but maybe just to offer a glimpse of hope um, and a, a sense of the discovery that awaits us on the far side of this a uh, very difficult situation for us. Um, we, are, we are looking forward. Um, we honor the artists who are a part of Dancer from the Dance and indeed across the range of disciplines that we work with at Irish Art Center. We thank all the organizations and funding entities uh, that are coming together to make this festival happen this year. Uh, and of course, to you all for watching. Have a great festival. Thank you, Aidan. And, um... One of the things that has um, been really, really important over these difficult months um, for all of us has been the wonderful complicity and support 
of the team. I must thank hugely Greta Burke, the company manager of Irish Modern Dance Theatre, who I haven't seen in the flesh since early March, but we are practically married on Zoom and Greta has helped bring the whole festival together with me. Um, I just couldn't do it without her. Also, Michelle Cahill, who is doing amazing work on marketing. Luca Truffarelli, our filmmaker, who's editing the programs and has been a wonderful artistic accomplice and collaborator. Um, I want to thank Chris Ignacio um, and Conlet Stanley. Conlet Stanley is our production manager and Chris is our web manager. And also uh, the backup of Justine Doswell, uh, together with, as I said before, our sponsors and our partners and also the Arts Council. Um, Carl Wallace, the festival's director, and uh, Victoria O'Brien, the, uh, the dance advisor from the Arts Council, and Liz Meany have been very, very helpful and supportive to helping us to keep going with all of this. Now, another very important part of uh, the festival has been the ongoing classes and workshops. So it's not just a festival about performances and showing work, it's also about process and about development. And we're very, very lucky to partner with, with two development agencies, with Dance Limerick and with Dance Ireland. I would now like to introduce uh, Sheila Creevy, the Chief Executive of Dance Ireland, um, who are running the classes and workshops for us um, every day this week. And um, we couldn't do it without any of you. So I'd like to hand it over now to Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. Hi, Joan, thank you very much. Um, Dance Ireland is absolutely delighted to partner with John Scott and Irish Modern Dance Theatre on Dancer from the Dance Festival. We appreciate the enormity of the task you have undertaken in bringing together this event under such extraordinary circumstances and we are absolutely really pleased to be doing our bit in support of the workshops and the classes especially when our studios are closed and we're in the process of starting to reopen we've discovered so many ways of sharing dance of engaging um, in physical activity whilst apart but still coming together in some way and you'll see that over this week dance ireland is Ireland's National Dance Development Organisation and the representative body for the professional dance community in Ireland. It is at moments like this when our community gathers to present who we are, when we connect with audiences to share our art, when we open up dialogue and debate about what dance is and could be for society, that I am most proud to work in support of dance. I am proud to have seen the resilience with which the dance sector has faced the many challenges in recent months. We've been extremely active, we've come together, we've connected, and we've made such extraordinary efforts to share our art, and this is a really great example of this. I want to congratulate everybody involved in Dancer from the Dance Festival, and I look forward to a wonderful week ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, and one of the things about Dancer from the Dance Festival and the New York connection that's very strong, it began as a result of conversations I had when we were performing at the Harkness Dance Center in the 92nd Street Y with Catherine Tharon. And uh, the idea for the program came from Catherine's curiosity and desire to see more Irish work and to know what was happening in Ireland with Irish choreography. So special thanks to Catherine Tharon for starting the seed. Last year, we brought 13 choreographers to New York and also to Dublin and showed the work. And that was a mammoth undertaking and a very rich encounter. This year with our, with our limitations, we have gone up to 32 choreographers. Um, I am so proud this would be nothing without the generosity and the support of all the choreographers. And it's really, really dedicated to all of you. Um, now, um, I would like to introduce a message from Maureen Kennelly, the director of the Irish Arts Council, who sent us a message today. She is unable to be here in person. And uh, we now are going to listen to Maureen's words. Thank you again.
Hello, it's Moin Kennelly here, Director of the Arts Council. I'm delighted to say hello as you launch Dancer from the Dance this evening. I'm sorry I can't be with you actually live. I applaud what you're doing here. It's absolutely fantastic to witness the unstoppable energy, vision and drive of the dance community in Ireland. It's incredible to witness how you've created these works and respecting HSE guidelines. I know that for the dance community in particular, the current protocols make life extremely difficult and challenging. And it's been really heartening to witness how you've overcome many of these challenges since the onset of the crisis. That's very much acknowledged and admired by everybody in the Arts Council. Dancer from the Dance also is terrific in terms of the gathering together of 32 Irish and Irish identifying choreographers from Ireland, Africa and the USA. It's wonderful the way you're crossing national borders, practices, ethnicities and generations with this work. The dance community has been particularly adept at reaching out to its audience and to its many, many supporters in the last few months. I wish you all the very best with it and we hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much, Maureen. Um, they're the words of the Arts Council Director, Maureen Kennelly. And I think it comes as a great reassurance and a wonderful boost for everyone in the dance community to hear those words of support and reassurance. And now it's time to introduce our amazing panelists. And um, I would like to introduce Michael Seaver, um, who I originally um, worked with Michael, I think in 1990. Michael composed music for some of my early work. And I called on Michael again to moderate this panel, um, How the Body Carries Stories. So I'd now like to introduce Michael Seaver and our wonderful panel, Linda Murray, Morgan Bullock, Toby Amutesu, Shona McRaymond, Shabelle Devitt, Siobhan Burke, Fergus O'Crohor, Rachel Gilkey, Louise Costello, and Laura Euprichard. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, some people are sharing the Zoom meeting with us here, others looking at uh, YouTube and Facebook Live. Uh, so you're very welcome wherever you are. Uh, as John listed there, there are 10 speakers this evening, um, each of whom could fill hours of interesting conversation, but Unfortunately, we have a short time, so we're just going to uh, kind of move as long as quickly as we can. But as with all great conversations, hopefully this is one that will spill over uh, into other forums. Unfortunately, we all can't go to the pub afterwards and continue the conversation, but hopefully some kind of conversation will take place virtually. Um, any conversation uh, takes place within different contexts. Um, physical context, emotional context, or, or psychic. And right now, we are under the cloud of uh, COVID-19. We're living under lockdowns, travel restrictions. We have little or no physical interaction with those we love. And also, um, we are coming to grips with uh, deaths. Um, over a half a million worldwide. New York, it's uh, had pretty horrific levels. Um, over 200,000 cases and probably 20,000 deaths. Um, and in general, right now for dance and for society in general, there is this sense of enforced stillness, uh, but it's also a period of simmering anger and unsettled politics. Uh, certainly the Black Lives Matters has become a really important force, not just in the USA, but um, protests are now worldwide as systemic racism has been pushed back. Uh, and this is, as I said, in Ireland as much as in the USA. Um, more, more specifically for dancers, stillness means no work, no creation, no income, no contact. Uh, and yet we go on. So festivals like this, uh, through this, we've found a way to engage with, with our audience to connect and certainly People like Morgan Bullock um, can reach much to our, all of our jealousy can reach millions of views um, with her fantastic dancing. Um, but for this discussion, we're, we're leaving the virtual aside and we're returning to the live 
body, the real physical thing that contains the sum of our experiences and that reveals these experiences uh, to those who, who, view the, who view the body. The title, um, How the Body Carries Stories, uh, begins with a how and not a what. So we, we can all accept that, yes, it, the body does carry stories. And what interests us in this uh, discussion tonight is, is how that happens. And we're going to get perspectives from a whole range of people. John has, has just listed who they are. Um, so I'm going to begin um, talking to uh, Shabail David, uh, who is a Irish dance artist uh, and choreographer. Um, and Shabail, uh, carrying stories can also mean carrying tradition or carrying training. Um, you yourself have trained in, in contemporary classical and uh, Shan knows uh, dancing. You've done your MA in contemporary dance at, at UL. So can you identify different strands of stories within your own body and experience as a, as a dancer? Hi, Michael. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, I think this is an absolutely fascinating topic. And I was really thinking about it today. I was trying to write down a few thoughts on the matter. and. Um, I do work with a lot of different styles, but I feel like the traditional um, is very kind of apt when it comes to talking about this and the idea of passing down through generations and, um, you know, yeah. So say from from my perspective, I learned my dancing, my channels dancing from my mum and then she learned her dancing from her granddad. Uh, and I kind of, I love the idea that I'm acquiring something and um, that's handed down uh, through generations uh, and that I'm, uh, when I'm performing, I'm performing my own movement, but uh, there, it's kind of engraved there, there is a history or um, a hand down engraved in it. So I think that does tell a story. Um, and I'm interested as well, I mean, in my practice, I'm kind of obsessed at the moment, this notion of realness and, you know, if, when you when you create a movement or when you're creating a piece in the studio and how um, you, you're really trying to get the story across and how that can, by the end of the process, be broken down. So say, you know, you're, how does it make it through rehearsals and First, first of all, research and development, and then tech, and then performance, and and finding that story in the realness every time. So yeah, I suppose for me it's that trying to just hang on to it and um, uh, keep keep the story going. I suppose. Mm -hmm. And so that that sense of realness, I mean, um, is something very honest within within the body. That's uh, that's something that. Um, we can see through if it's not if it's not real, definitely. so it is something that you definitely have to tap into. Sure, yeah, um, yeah, and I, I I've I've been interested. I I was asked John asked me to perform something for this for this festival, and it was something that I performed in the past. It was something before in two thousand sixteen, and uh, I I found I found it really challenging, but in a really in a really interesting way. Uh, and it was really interesting for me to bring a piece into into now and the fact that my body is different and I was different then and I'm different now and but I'm the same so you know it's like mm -hmm. uh, uh, how does it feel now how do I make it real now how do I make it um how, how do I make it relevant to myself um I'm sure like people watching it will find it relevant in some way but how can I unearth what I was originally trying to tell um, and I found it was a really powerful experience actually um, and I, I find performing can be just a very powerful way of experiencing time not to get so very deep to start <laughs> off part of it. Yeah. Um, but the body again it, the body tells its own story in time so um yeah so it has it has been a, a powerful um experience and sorry in the as well the online realm 
that 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 notion of relevance is is extra important because you're so limited with what you have and so yeah that's it and did the piece really change that much in those intervening four years uh well i i what i what i made was essentially you know the beats and everything were the same uh, and the timings and it was the same track um but obviously uh i was in a site specific uh sp space and yeah it, it it did change and um there there was a lot of frustration and my, i think when i made it first there was a lot of frustration but now it felt more uh like some of those frustrations had been um kind of worked out and then that there were new ones being unearthed and obviously now it's all the tumultuous um it's such a tumultuous time uh politically and everything it just felt like there were new things to be frustrated about <laughs> mm -hmm. as there always are so yeah i think it's it's fascinating yeah yeah um siobhan if i could uh speak to you siobhan burke is a, a dancer and um dance writer, dance critic with the, with the New York Times. Um, Siobhan, you wrote um, a piece a, a while back about um, being a, a river dancer yourself, ex-river dancer. Um, and then I just found it interesting, the, uh, the attitude that you seem to find in other people um, to this. Uh, and it's almost like something that, that you hear. But what I'm, what I'm interested is in, it, that sense of kind of fluid identities, fluid dancing identities. So like for you, one hand you're dancing river dance, on the other hand, then you dance trio A. Um, so how do these, uh, how does this, the body change with, with different pieces or in terms of the stories that, that it, it carries? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, just first to clarify, I've never actually danced the entirety of Yvonne no. Rainer's trio A. Seven <laughs> I, seconds though. <laughs> I was in a I was in a project, uh, a film installation project where I was one of many dancers who danced seven seconds of trio A, and even that is actually incredibly challenging. Um, and you followed up from Wendy Phelan, as far as I remember. I did, yeah. Wendy Whelan, the, the, the prima ballerina, and mm -hmm. now one of the directors of New York City Ballet came before me. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. it was, yeah, that was a, an amazing project to be a part of. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I've been thinking a lot about my own sort of identity as a dancer in, in relation to um, the title of this panel. And um, you know, I'm primarily a writer now, but I come, I come to that from my embodied experience of being a dancer from uh, really the age of four. I started formal Irish step dancing lessons at the age of eight. And, um, you know, I think that recently as I've grown older, I've come to appreciate more my very early experiences as an Irish dancer. Um, and the ways in which it, I guess when I, because I went from being kind of a competitive Irish dancer to then going to college where a college dance program where the emphasis was on contemporary dance. And I always felt like I really couldn't like move my body in the way I wanted to. Um, just this limitation, I felt this, this immense limitation um, just using my head and my torso and dropping my weight and um, I think that for a long time, I was very kind of angry with this Irish dance training that had been, uh, I don't wanna say it was even imposed on me, I chose it, that's, that's, that's the path that I took, but I started to kind of see its limitations and be frustrated with those. Um, but then as I began, as I kind of moved through that phase of kind of learning more contemporary dance, modern jazz, um, I, I started to realize that actually these, um, these, ways of moving that I developed as an Irish dancer are making me unique, you know, and I, I began to find choreographers who were really interested in working with the way that um, my own body worked and they were interested in that individuality. Um, and so 
in my, in my journey as a dancer, I feel I was able to kind of reconcile some of these um, tensions that had previously felt really like in conflict um, into something that just felt more holistic and into kind of accepting my myself. Um, but it actually took leaving river dance um, to <laughs> really accomplish that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, was that the day to day, I would say humdrum, but like that monotony of doing the same thing all the time that you began to feel in a in a box? Yes, it was. Um, it was the kind of there's not a lot of space for uh, personal expression in river dance. It's a, you know, very well oiled machine. Um, and I, yeah, needed to get into spaces that were more creative, more exploratory, more with a greater emphasis on improvisation um, to really be able to kind of tap into something that felt like a truer dancer self. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, great. Rachel, if I could um, talk to you for a bit. You, Rachel Gilkey is the uh, Director of Programming and Education at the Irish Arts uh, Centre. Um, and yesterday when I went onto your website, the first image that came up was um, a photograph of Una Doherty um, from the first part of her solo Hope Hunt where she's standing beside a um, pretty battered up car. It's, it's not the usual um, Irish dancing body that um, people would uh, think of. And, and similarly, the uh, Irish Arts Art Centre, I know, uh, commissioned uh, Mufatao Yusuf's uh, observations, which is going to premiere on, on Thursday. So maybe you, uh, you know, as an American working within an Irish art center, do you see anything new within what has traditionally been perceived as an Irish dancing body? Um, yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting, question i think if you approach it from perhaps a, a an irish american a perceived irish american perspective the irish dancing body probably lives much more in that traditional context um, and more along the lines of what Siob siobhan was just speaking about um, and i think something that has been exciting for myself as a, an arts programmer who um, has really only come to engage with dance from a more critical perspective as opposed to just an audience enjoying perspective in the last decade or so is that you can get both i think that what traditional dance can do um, and can deliver as an experience in the states as sort of both um, kind of honoring what has come before but as well as what is you know, what is Ireland now? I think that there have been some very powerful stories being told there, um, but you also have this really rich, vibrant storytelling tradition through the body, through the physical body in contemporary dance in Ireland, through artists like Una Muftau, um, you know, uh, Emma Martin, um, the work that Cheval de had, has done with, um, uh, Kristen Fontanella, the sort of exploration of how traditional and contemporary can work side by side, or what might appear as the kind of um, complete, you know, where, where perhaps Una's work wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't look at that and see any traditional Irish within it. And I think she also kind of speaks about that. But, um, you know, I'm also in the back of my mind is often this quote from Emma Martin from a few years ago when she's also talking about how contemporary dance embodies this Irish self-consciousness and um, and and how you can look at in a kind of um, in a communal aspect the Irish the Irish body on the dance floor and how that is something that uh, I think is a place for the Irish body to become unselfconscious or to kind of remove that self-consciousness. Um, and I like seeing where that shows up in contemporary dance work 
And as an organization in New York, the ability to be able to present that in the past in partnerships and other venues like Bershnikov Art Center and 92Y um, and La Mama, but soon to be able to present that in our own home as well um, a, as a way to show these contemporary dance artists um, and, and the stories that they're telling that, that are Irish stories, stories of the Irish body, but um, and sharing that with with New York, New York audiences and New York dance audiences who might have a different perception of what the Irish body might might be. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Morgan, if I could uh, move to, on to you, because uh, you are somebody who, um, if they're talking about uh, expectations of the traditional uh, Irish or Irish American dancing body, um, you've c confounded those i mean amidst the joyous celebrations and the invitations to come to ireland from the tea shock on saint patrick's day and um your invitation to perform at river dance hopefully that will uh, happen at some stage because i know that the tour had, was called off at the uh, at the last minute um I mean, amidst this, there were some accusations of, you know, cultural misappropriation by a small minority, and I'm not going to even discuss that because we all know that that's absolute um, nonsense. But um, I suppose I could just ask you to reflect uh, on your dancing body and and see and and talk about how it carries uh, stories. Um, I know you you trained in tap and ballet before you um, before you took up Irish dancing um, and I think that journey is something that that you'll be addressing in in your piece uh, on Wednesday um, tall and straight my mother taught me uh, so could you talk a bit about that work and your own kind of journey yeah um, as someone who does not fit the typical look of a, a traditional Irish dancer I have always just had to be comfortable with doing something that's just completely unexpected. Um, I always, you know, whenever I introduce myself as an Irish dancer, people are kind of taken aback by it. They have to, you know, just like, <laughs> I see a lot of suppressed reactions and um, it's just, it's just unexpected. So I think my journey has been very, it has reflected on that a lot. I mean, it's something that is a huge factor for me as someone who is as passionate about Irish dancing as I am. And um, I think that the, the piece um, Tall and Straight My Mother Taught Me is definitely um, just a reflection of my dance journey of not being confident doing what was expected of me. I wasn't very comfortable doing ballet and tap. It was something I kind of just did because I was put into dance when I was three I always wanted to be a dancer, but I hadn't yet discovered Irish dancing. And as soon as I did, it changed a lot about me as a person, as a dancer. I started to feel more comfortable um, and feel like I could express myself a little bit more. And it's, it's an interesting thing for me to talk to other Irish dancers about their experience with Irish dance because I feel like a lot of people who were put um, put into Irish dance at a young age, maybe by Irish parents or, you know, living in Ireland or America, possibly being Irish American, I feel like it's almost um, seen as something that is, it's a hard form of dance to express yourself with because of the, um, it's naturally kind of rigid, but um, I had a kind of opposite experience as a dancer going from training with ballet and tap to Irish dancing. It kind of just felt natural to me as a dancer. And um, the piece that I did, it was honestly uncomfortable um, at times for me to do things that weren't really Irish dance. I feel like Irish dance carries throughout anything else that I do. And um, I think that just kind of goes to show how big of a part of my life it is um, as someone who trains in the, in the art form. It, it's really become almost part of my identity in a way, not in a way that it's overtaken other aspects of my identity, but it's just like, it's who I am. I'm a black woman, I'm an Irish dancer, and those two things together make up um, it's, it's kind of like that, 
like encompasses my story almost because it's just like you can imagine just from those two facts that there's going to be a little bit of a you know there's some there's something interesting there it's different so um yeah I think that the way that my body carries that story is just from in whatever I do there's Irish dance influence even as a student, a college student at a university that has a big focus on the arts, exploring other forms of dance, maybe going back to my roots in dance and trying to um, try out ballet and tap again. It's always going to be a mixture of Irish dance and everything else, just because it, that's how I came into being a confident person. And that's like Irish dance is what took me um, beyond all of my insecurities and my self-doubt that I was experiencing before I allowed myself to grow as an Irish dancer and just accept the fact that I'm different. It's, I'm always going to be different. I'm always going to be, you know, when I walk into a fesh and Irish dance competition, a lot of people look at me because I don't look like everyone else there. So it's just, um, getting over that as someone who going into it was not confident in myself has made me almost, it's, it's just become such a huge factor in, in who I am today. Yeah. And it, another huge factor in, in your popularity is your um, willingness to take the Irish dancing steps and you know, uh, put other music on it. So in other words, you're not completely um, stuck in in the the competitive dance world. That this is this is the way it is. You're quite free, and you're you're willing to to um, to expand its its expressive potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's been a huge thing. Just um, being able to use my training in a way to express myself outside of the box of Irish dance. And I think it's important as um, participants in such a traditional cultural dance form to um, do what we can as Irish dancers to like spread the culture and maybe try to reach more audience than just people who are seeking out traditional Irish dancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, Toby, if I could uh, speak to you for a while. Um, Toby Amateso is a, a hip hop uh, dancer and, and choreographer uh, based in, in Limerick uh, in Ireland. Uh, and Toby, you have a piece coming up on that will be premiered on, on Thursday um, called False Emotions Appearing Real. Um, and in your uh, introduction to it, you say it's, it's a um, the response was a, a fight or flight response and it's the piece is a exploration of, of that um, could you could you talk about that and and how you place your own body within that um, conflict as you see it um, yeah um, basically basically I got the, uh, the inspiration um, um, organically and it, it came to me because of um, in light of what has been happening and um, we seem to be battling with some sort of um, fear. And, um, and yeah, it's just to um, um, look at the responses that come to us naturally when we, when we are faced with a situation that we can either, uh, we pose with two options uh, or, or with two um, decisions. And the decisions are either to fight or you flee. And that's, that's, um, that's been a biological um, um, response throughout ages um, from the dawn of time. And it's embedded in our bodies and our DNA. And um, so, so for me to then naturally just kind of um, 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 hone in on that to see what I can actually um, uh, portray or bring out or, or, or show um, in terms of movement, um, the music and the location and um, to bring it back home to, to myself in a personal in um, um, in a personal journey that I have been I have been through, whereby I I had the option to either fight or flee, um, uh, fight to flight response, and um, and um, naturally um, I I most of the time choose the fight because um, I'm just 
I'm just like that. Uh, well, not that I'm just like that. Um, my environmental, my environment, my background, my upbringing, my family, society have made me um, 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 like that, you know. And um, and I'm glad that I I chose to always fight and not fight in 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 physical form. Um, there's 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 different types of fight that you can have, and um, um, yeah, and and even in some situations, um, fleeing. So the the flight or flight response, the flight could be also a fight, um, depending on the context that you're looking at it at, uh, or, or from. Um, so so it's it's a very int um, interesting um, whereby. Um, um, bringing that um, um, into the current situation that is happening now, um, we could uh, we could choose. So, so for example, now I'll use myself for, for example. I could choose to let the situation affect me, um, and and be a victim of that situation. I can you understand that, that is happening, or or I I could decide to you know what I could turn it around, and um, and use that energy. For some um, to 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 tackle it a different way, or or see it from a different perspective, or use it, or um, um, use it as a stepping stone, or or you understand? So 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 I've al I've always seen um, the f there's always I, I've been um, uh, I always see the fight, um, and I always see because by seeing by putting myself in that mentally and physically, it, it allows me to see um, uh, many options that people that choose the flight response might not see, you know, and, and, and it's just um, um, training that muscles um, 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 that, that we, we naturally, because, because it's easier um, in some situations to, to be hit with those, uh, to that, with that rush of emotion to, to, to act. And, and the first thing, and most time is to flee, um, 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 th that's the instinctive um, 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 bias with that, with that, with the flight, fight or fight, fight response. Whereby the fight is a more, um, um, it has to be, uh, it's a more conscious, um, 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 uh, it's a more conscious um, ability or, or or thought process that okay, you choose to want to do something about the situation. So so you. It, it puts you in a in a in a place whereby you are consciously actually choosing to stand, um, um, yeah, and and that's why um, um, I chose to um, explore that um, that in in the piece that I'll be showing. Mm -hmm. And did you um, find um, within the your own physical body those two um, physical sensations? Yes, yes, uh, uh, um. Definitely, because um, I don't want to give um, um, a lot of the piece away, but sure. but but in in the different en um, environmental sub um, structures in the in the piece uh, um, um, brought a different um, um, element to um, um, to my movement and to my bodies, and then and then even even in the locations how how I have to move, um, there's a very real eminent threat there in those locations. Um, um, so, so um, using that as a catalyst um, 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 throughout my body to to actually um, um, ch channel that. So, so I didn't. There was no one time I was detached from those flight of fight or flight um, 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 emotions or feelings. Um, um, it was with me throughout the piece, and especially um, what was happening in. What is happening in society um, um, really brought that home, you know. Um, so, so, so I really fully embodied that. Yeah, great. Uh, that's a really interesting, and and I think hopefully we'll return to um, this later because um, I know that um, Siobhan, you've written about um, dance uh, as protest uh, within some of the uh, Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations. Um, but for now, I just wanted to push on and maybe talk with um, Louise, um, who's the, the program, uh, Louise Coslo, who's the program manager at um, Dance Ireland. Um, and Louise, 
uh, John told me that you were the one who actually came up with the phrase, uh, the body can carry stories, uh, so we owe you. Uh, thanks for coming up with, with the title. Um, can you just talk about what that, um, what your understanding of that, that phrase is? Um, thank you, Michael. <laughs> I suppose um, I was a practicing artist um, up until sort of 2012 when I moved into um, programming and producing. And I've had a really sort of privileged existence within that to see a lot of work and to talk with a lot of artists. Um, and I think some of the things that sort of uh, have stayed with me about that, um, uh, I remember something that Liz Roach said last year when we did a podcast with her, was it was about the power of presence of the dancing body um, and about how you have to stay with your particular language and have resilience about that. Um, and I've also, we had a 30th anniversary, a lot of conversations around that at Dance Ireland last year um, in looking at the very particularity of, of people within the sort of the pioneers of contemporary dance in Ireland. To me, it seemed really obvious that they were sort of looking at new ways of expression to tell different stories and to bring different bodies into our sort of performing context in Ireland. Um, and ha having spent time away from Ireland um, sort of uh, a few years ago, I, I was reminded when I returned that there's something very radical about the language of the body uh, in a society which has a really strong literary and verbal tradition. Um, and that's something that personally draws me to dance. Um, over and over again and, and that's that's how it operates sort of at the edge of uh, consciousness and I have to, to credit a colleague, a, a European colleague with that phrase but um, it, it can cross borders quite easily, it can get through the, the, the sort of the, the world of words and, and it can get to the heart of things really quickly. Um, I remember seeing John Scott's Fall and Recover, I actually reviewed it for a UK magazine in 2005 and it was just massively eloquent about the different experiences but it, it didn't say a word um, and it was very it, the very liveness of it was, was I found it really affecting and I think this has stayed in my mind as I've traveled through different countries and just in terms of how international the dance community is um, even when a choreographer sets work it becomes something different depending on who dances it and I also think we have a, a new generation of dancers who are willing to cross boundaries between art forms and, and make multidisciplinary work um, and look for ways to say things differently. And, and I think we're seeing a lot of these stories, as, as um, particularly in festivals over the last few years. I think it was one of the most exciting things about coming back to Ireland was uh, seeing um, how younger artists are um, working together and, and while there are connections with the traditions, both in contemporary dance and in traditional dance, I can see how people are recreating that around, um, around what is very much our contemporary life in Ireland. Um, I feel in some ways that dance is far ahead in terms of being radical around the kind of bodies and stories we have um, in our public space. Um, and I suppose that's really what informed the thinking around the title. Great. Um, Laurie, if I, could, um, if I could move on to you. Um, your uh, independent curator and producer says here, but most people in Dublin will know you from your time as uh, artistic director of the Dublin Dance Festival. Um, and back in, John reminded me earlier when I was chatting to him back in, in um, 2010, uh, you had a symposium at the festival called the uh, Many Bodies of Contemporary Dance. Um, and that was the year that uh, Ryman Tog was there. Uh, Jeremy had, had brought over uh, Heidi Latsky um, and Terry O'Connor had created a solo for uh, Jean Butler. Um, so can you talk, um, not necessarily about specifically that, but just how you see the, um, the many bodies, uh, not just I suppose of contemporary dance, but uh, of, of dance in general? Um, <clears throat> sure, thanks, Michael. It's um, great to be here. Um, when I was thinking about this topic, I realized that a lot of people, a lot of dancers, both African American dancers and Irish dancers, have spoken to me about the accumulation of abuse and repression in their bodies. And I thought about how to talk about that 
but those aren't really my stories. So <clears throat> didn't seem totally appropriate. But it is, it's interesting to me that it was 10 years ago that we had a thread in the Dublin Dance Festival about the different bodies of contemporary dance. Um, and yes, that, that symposium was um, coordinated in association with Deirdre Mulroney and the Graduate Center, and that went really well. But even more, I guess, visibly to me, um, <clears throat> seeing those young Irish dancers working with Ryland Hogue and Young People of Voices, um, as well as the differently abled bodies in Heidi's GIMP, and the nearly 80-year-old, at that point, Yvonne Rayner, um, <clears throat> on stage, you know, also Sylvia Grabodi in her tight dress, if you remember that, at, at the Cube, and, and David Bolger and his mother mm -hmm. um, premiered that year. And I think they think those bodies truly articulate the story of who can dance and why can you dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Laurie, I know you had pre-cooked um, videos and uh, stuff. Is it's there something a, that you had wanted to specifically <laughs> talk um, about? Or? Well, I'm actually uh, the curator of performing arts at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans now. And um, we've been working with an artist from the Bay Area. Her name is Joe Kreider. And she's working on a piece, she's made a piece called The Weight Room that we want to bring to New Orleans next year. And <clears throat> what I think is extremely illustrative of this topic is it's based on her own personal experience and other experiences, others' experiences of having um, a loved one who is incarcerated. <clears throat> and so um, she has created with her set designer a set that has a lot of hanging chairs that represent the discomfort of the number of hours that she would have to wait to see her partner and other people have that same experience. And I just had 30 seconds of a uh, video, which I think, uh, if I could find, um, shoot. Yeah, this went flawlessly in the rehearsal. It did, and now it's not coming up. But anyway, I can I can post the link for y'all, and um, I, I would just suggest watching it because mm -hmm. um, at, at the conclusion, they, there's a lot of flying in, around a twenty foot pole, and that freedom when you're talking about an incarcerated person just. It resonates so much that um, I find it really uh, brings this topic into visibility. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, certainly we saw a glimpse of it earlier on and it looked uh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Ari. Shona, can I um, talk with you uh, for a while? Uh, Shona McRaymond is a, a freelance dance writer um, in based in Dublin uh, and is often a colleague of mine on the comfortable critics chairs that you find in the plush theatres <laughs> in Dublin. Um, we were talking earlier, I'm just thinking of, of uh, Una Doherty as, as an example of, um, as a dancer who um, can perfectly embody uh, different experiences. Um, I'm thinking of, of things like Hope Hunt um, and a Belfast prayer where the 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 um, male angry male aggressive male is like almost perfectly uh, embodied by her um, and Shona just uh, as somebody who has sat in theatres and seen an awful lot of of dance um, through the years have you noticed any change in or uh, trends or anything that that um, ties us all together of a of a Irish dancing Body or, or in more general, how a, how a body carries stories? Sure. Um, yes, I have spent quite a bit of time um, <laughs> uh, watching dance over the many years. I think one of the interesting things about um, the changes is really 
when you're looking at how um, the body carries stories, you also looking at the kinds of stories that have been either, you know, kept secret, been repressed, and now is, there is a time to tell them and um, that somehow everything came at the same time as, as almost, you know, the nation state began to mature um, and was able to manage to expose these stories. I just felt dance and the language of dance seemed to me to be the best form for articulating whether these were transgressions um, of the body, of the Irish body, where um, literally, and how you do that, and you know, dealing with uncomfortable um, subjects that really, in a sense, had to do with the body, and how we, as a society, were able to look at that differently. And I just felt dance, you know, as I think it was Louise just talked about how it was almost ahead of itself, the curve in a maybe drawing on the power of dance as a language, you know, and mining the ambiguity of that language, which allows you to deal with the kinds of conflicts or challenges, um, you know, the, the contradictions in a very, you know, very fluent and eloquent way. You know, um, again, echoing something that um, I think um, it was also Louise who was talking about um, the fall and recover piece that John Scott did many years ago. You know, again, you know, the way that dance can deal with uncertainty and with trauma and with all those things. And I think it's been really good for the Irish body to have had, you know, um, and for the society of access to the fantastic choreographers that we've had who've, you know, taken on troubling, difficult subjects, but it's not all dark too. I mean, I think also that, you know, we've learned how to play again as well. And that there is, I, I, I just think that it's just been a very interesting journey that I think Shona's just frozen there. Um, hopefully, it's not me that is frozen. Um, but uh, I, as a, oh, sorry, Shona, you certainly for me I, you froze. Yeah, I probably um, froze for the millions of viewers. <laughs> sorry indeed, about that. I, mean, I don't know what happened. Yeah, censorship, obviously. Obviously, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's interesting. The fall and recover has been been mentioned twice, and and for me, one of the uh, the, the way that that piece worked, the only way that piece worked, is the fact that there were no words in it. Mm. That these people were were using fully physical um, expression alone, um, because the words could not deal um, or. Uh, um, uh, you know, couldn't deal with with the the issues that were there. The other thing I, I was thinking as well, Sean, is that oftentimes theatre companies here have collaborated with um, dance companies when Hugely. words have failed them as well. Yes, absolutely, and I I think that that's also been a very interesting way because of of how movement in just in itself can be so expressive can maybe not just tell the story, but give and even, you know, excavate something else below the words, the kind of pre-verbal, you know, of that, um, of an emotion or a situation. Um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to see um, Sylvie Guillem, um, the marvelous Sylvie Guillem, and um, uh, A Month in the Country, Frederick Ashton's A Month in the Country. And at the end of it, I mean, her body just is so expressive and articulate and moving in the sense of kind of lost opportunity or loss of, and it brought to mind immediately that closing scene, or not the closing scene, but one of the scenes in, uh, of Peggy Mike in Playboy of the Western World. And again, that kind of, but where she was almost lost for words, you know, as she said, I've lost the, you know, 
um, say we're in the Western world. And just that scene, it, exactly that thing, it mirrored, but it was even more powerful when there was no words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Fergus, uh, if I could uh, turn to you, uh, Fergus Okohur is a, a choreographer and dancer, um, originally from uh, Onrin in Waterford, um, now uh, back in London. Um, and Fergus, we, an awful lot of what we've been talking about uh, have been people talking about the, their, some of their experiences um, and how that creates their dancing body. But I was really interested in something that you uh, were writing in your uh, blog about um, a workshop that you did and you drew attention to um, the physical isolation that we're all feeling right now uh, during the uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdown and just how um, your physical being is also made up of, of other people and how um, we often forget that. Yeah, I, I guess for me, it's very important. I mean, it's been something that I've been thinking about for a while, this idea of interdependence, because we we're so, and I, I think it's an interesting thing to think about in our decade of centenaries, as we're going to be sort of thinking about what independence mean, means, I think actually interdependence feels like a healthier um, aspiration to celebrate because, um, I think the idea of independence is if we were uh, not related, not reliant on other people is something that has suited a particular kind of economic approach for the past number of years. And actually nothing that I achieve is possible without the support of others. And um, the workshop I talked about uh, was, um, uh, it was a, a choreography by a, a French choreographer called Eric Min, Min Kwon Kestin. And, and it was basically a kind of glided, a guided clubbing experience. But it made me realize um, that when I dance now on my own in this room, which is a, a kind of bedroom and not very uh, amenable for dancing, that the only resource that I have are the many people that have danced through me and with me. I, I feel them all of the time. Um, but that starts to make me think about um, in this context of telling stories. Uh, uh, for me, it's very important that I work in contemporary dance. So as in, we're in an art form where we get to make new stories. We make decisions. It's not just about passing on um, inherited stories. Uh, and so it's about taking that form and translating it in a way we'll say that Chabelle or Morgan do in relation to traditional Irish dance. There is that exploration. And I think it's very important um, for me to, to think about, you know, who's in the room, who's on the stage, who, who is allied with whom, because it's not about telling a story of how Irishness used to be. We get to help define what Irishness can be and will be for the future. Um, and I think that's what's so radical about our work. And in a way, for me, it's important that dance isn't a language that represents, it's actually an action that does. So again, to talk about Full and Recover, it's about who those people are on stage together, the work that they've done, uh, or the work that Krieglon does. It's, it's like, it's important who those people are. It's not that they're representing, it's that they are. So I think um, that sense of what particularly live dance does show up and say, this is the way that the world could be. I think that for me is uh, both the challenge and the excitement of it. Yeah, yeah. And that's really uh, uh, an important thing. I remember years ago at a workshop um, when the, everybody was introducing themselves, I said, my name is, and I was immediately shut down by the person saying, your name is something, you have a dog. Um, you, who are you? You know, and, and I think that's, that's exactly that's exactly right. Um, can you talk a bit, a bit about the the, um, the piece uh, that you, uh, and it's kind of a bit of a reworking, isn't it, uh, Latex? Yes, so uh, Latex 2020 um, is, John in fact had asked us to, if we wanted to revisit work that we'd done before. And particularly at this moment, in a way, honestly, um, in my home in London, um, the idea of finding kind of creative stimulus of thinking about doing something new is very difficult in this situation. So I made a deliberate choice to kind of reconnect with things that had resourced me before. 
And um, so I went back to work Cure, which was made by commissioning six other choreographers, so dancers and a visual artist that I'd worked with on Tabernacle. And um, I commissioned them to make work, them having made work for me as artists or as performers before, now it was for them um, to make work for me as a soloist. So this piece is the section that Sarah Brown, who's a visual artist primarily, has made. Um, and it's been fascinating to, to kind of work across distance. So she's in Dublin at the moment, um, that it's actually through the material, this latex sculpture, this latex object, which I happen to have, um, but that she made, that it's through that that she's made the choreography. And, and now it was a chance to revisit what that section looked like. It was actually made on its own before and then put together with the other pieces. And now we've sort of detached it, looked at it again and thought, um, with this body now, this time later, in this context in London, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Linda, finally, can I um, can I talk to you? Um, you're the uh, curator at the uh, Jerome Robbins Dance Division of the uh, New York uh, Public Library. And uh, I suppose as an archivist, hopefully you can give a nice um, bow on the top of this, but you obviously have a huge broad historical viewpoint on this question of how the body tells a story. Um, so what are your reflections? Yeah, and I think a lot of people have touched on it in different uh, ways today. Um, but when I think about the body carrying a story, I always think of what Martha Graham said, that the body never lies. And we've, we've talked a lot about the fact that um, Ireland's cultural legacy is uh, based on our gift with language but words can be very problematic and deceptive. And even when we're attempting to be truthful, there can be a, a multitude that's concealed beneath that, that doesn't surface up. Um, and so dance for me is, um, you know, it's, it's a space where uh, the most honest mode of communication is at our disposal uh, because it benefits from being highly individualistic. That is, it's my body and my movement, but it's also universally understood. And for me, no other form can allow one to more fully express your cultural and kinetic specificity within that form of global dialogue. Um, I was thinking through this weekend about the notion of the body carrying a story forward, and I see it in several ways. In, I think the concept that's most familiar to dance artists is that transmission of embodied knowledge that occurs in the studio, where we store learned technique in our muscles and bones that's passed down to us by elders and that we impart in turn to the next generation. And in repertory as well, dancers safeguard choreography in their bodies and are often part of the process of sustaining choreographic intent through time. Um, and essential to the very definition of dance is this methodology that relies on phys physical proximity and verbal cues and an emotional connection. It, I think it's because it, you know, it taps into the very foundation of what it means to be human. And it can be understood on a very basic level by anybody, uh, but it simultaneously requires a level of heightened awareness and responsiveness that is beyond the grasp of everybody but a trained dancer. Um, it's a mode of sharing knowledge that's not replicated in any other academic or artistic discipline in the same way, but that transfer of information is not exact. And in inhabiting technique or choreography, our bodies have to adapt from their natural inclinations to execute the movement. But each body is different and we compensate differently to achieve the same goal, subtly but incrementally shifting the original choreography toward a new horizon. Um, Sometimes in dance, we resist this change. And I see that mostly in pedagogical technique, but other times you see choreographers really embrace that idea and um, they focus in on the individual gifts of their dancers and adapt previously composed work to suit the bodies of the present rather than trying to hold on to a version of the past, which I think is what Fergus really beautifully called interdependent body. Uh, George Balanchine in particular, um, I'm always surprised that people are um, particularly uh, strident in defending Balanchine choreography because he was so inclined toward this approach of reworking masterpieces to suit the needs of dancers of different generations that his uh, artistic partner, Lincoln Kirstein, wrote a position paper in the 1950s that choreography may lie out outside um, what can be protected by copyright law because dance is so influenced by the very fact of who is doing the dancing. 
And in more recent years, um, there's a wonderful um, dance and disability advocate and uh, choreographer, Alice Shepherd, who was working over here, who brought to my attention the fact that the UK granted additional copyrights to dancers with disability to choreographic work made by somebody else as their own bodies radically transformed the original choreographic vision and intent. Um, there's another part to carrying stories, which I think has also been brought up. Um, I think it was Shauna who called it an excavation of emotion, which I thought was a lovely way to phrase it. Um, and that's, you know, it's um, kind of the way we carry stories um, as individuals, particularly our trauma, and that's inscribed in our bodies. And this is something that can be um, brought out through somatic practice. Um, on a granular level, it can be about your own lived experience, but extrapolating out, you can explore whether collective trauma and grief manifests itself across a national core. I have to admit, I was a bit of a late adapter to this way of thinking. Um, when I was dancing, my, my knowledge of my body was about the pain, the physical pain I experienced, and I would have totally denied that there was this murkier emotional kind of scar tissue that could be lying beneath. Um, but I've since had experiences that has brought me around to a different way of thinking. Um, when, when I think about what I do now in my role as um, you know, the person who oversees the largest repository of dance material um, that we have globally, I'm always struck by the fact that archives themselves are very much about individual emotion and, and physical presence. Um, and yet dance, which is so much an embodiment of, I, of these ideas, has for most of history been relegated beyond the boundaries of archival space. Dance itself is about inhabiting the present to the exclusion of all else in that sort of sense of performance, but it is also the connective tissue that holds together our cultural memory across bodies. And so I find it, I've always struggled with that, that notion that dance has, has never been able to find for itself until quite recently a space in our cultural memory. Um, Archiving itself is an act of remembrance. We safeguard materials, not for the inherent value of the object itself, but rather to cherish the narrative it contains. As a species concerned with recording our history, we innately understand the importance of placing material into an archive. Um, there's a, an archival theorist called Terry Cook, who I often quote, in, in 2011, he made this declaration that we are what we keep. And the article uh, that he wrote itself was about the history of appraisal and what it means uh, to select material for archives and museums. But at its core, that phrase cuts to an essential truth about the practice of archiveship. As human beings, we instinctively place value on any items that survive across time, but we ascribe special meaning to items that are purposefully kept. The knowledge that those who went before us took extraordinary measures to ensure the safety of particular objects informs our reading of them. And we assume legitimacy of those items as part of our cultural legacy. So placing something, something in an archive assures its longevity, not just physically, but as part of the continuum of intellectual and artistic inquiry. Space museums is finite and we're defined by the history that we curate for ourselves. So if we are what we keep, what we don't keep is what we eliminate out of the narrative. Um, when the division I represent began collecting in 1944, the entire field of dance was all but absent from protection and legitimacy of archives. Archives and museums are built on the collection of tangible artifacts and dance lacked the ability to provide a core manuscript. So I think that this work that John is helping us to undertake today of acknowledging the centrality of the body as an archival site and a space where historical and personal narrative is cherished. It's essential for dance if it's to be afforded the same protections and rights as the rest of the performing arts. Great, thank you. That's uh, very eloquently um, said. Uh, I think now we're going to uh, open up uh, the discussion to uh, to everyone. Um, and uh, just before then, I did get a private message from John uh, to say that some of the dancers did speak words in in Fall and Recover, and uh, I think the, the point that <laughs> I was making was that the process of making it. Um, was a nonverbal process. And I remember talking to John at the time and, and had they had a theater practitioner who was asking them to write down or tell their stories through words, then that would have been a different 
uh, and almost impossible to have achieved uh, what was achieved in Fall and Recover, that it was the very non-verbal nature of their um, engagement with, with their uh, past and their embodied um, uh, wounds that um, uh, spoke most eloquently and, and there was the, that was the, the success of the piece. Um, so uh, I think we are going to uh, broaden everything out, as I said. Um, I don't know, I know some people, it's probably been almost an hour since they spoke. So if any of the early uh, contributors want to, um, to comment on things that were uh, subsequently uh, said, uh, we can do that. Um, I'm still waiting for the screen to go into um, so I can uh, see people. Um, but if not, um, then I might just uh, touch on something that Toby had mentioned um, and uh, to say about Siobhan. Uh, Siobhan, I know that you wrote um, about uh, dance as a protest in the um, Black Lives uh, Matter demonstrations uh, for, the, for the New York Times. Could you maybe uh, talk a bit about uh, that? Sure. Um, I also just want to point out that there is a question in the chat. Oh, um, so yeah, perhaps I, I think it's a several uh, important questions. So okay. um, do you want me to speak to that and then go to the yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I recently wrote a story that was looking at um, dance at a, as a part of the protests that have been happening recently. Um, globally, but I specifically spoke to dancers in three um, US cities in New York, Chicago, and Minneapolis about um, what it means to them to dance and protest. And um, I guess one inspiration for the story was that um, at that time, I was seeing a lot of, um, well, first of all, just to say that in New York, it, it it feels and has felt since the beginning of June, like there's just been this incredible kind of like revolutionary energy and spirit. Um, and it's um, just been an incredible thing to be a part of um, the Black Lives Matter protests here. Um, it's a, a privilege <laughs> to be able to be part of them. And um, the story kind of came about um, looking at the kind of contrast between the images of police violence that um, I was seeing coming out of protests, which were just like filling my Twitter feed. Um, there was a lot of, I mean, as everybody knows, um, there, there was just a great deal of violence inflicted on protesters by police um, in the early days of uh, these protests here. It's continuing to happen. It just happened yesterday at the Queer Liberation March here in New York and at other places. Um, but in very early June, um, I was seeing a lot of these images of the ways that protesters were being harmed. And, um, and in contrast to that, because I, my kind of social media world is so dance focused, I was also seeing um, just these incredible expressions of joy um, resistance through the expression of joy um, that was taking place at protests and also um, really interesting kind of cross-cultural expressions of cross-cultural solidarity happening through dance. So one of the, the groups I talked to was um, the leaders of um, an Aztec um, indigenous dance group that's based in Minneapolis who has been really active in um, Black Lives Matter protests in Minneapolis for several years. Um, they kind of come out, um, they don't think of themselves as performers really. Um, uh, they, they come out and they, they dance, sing, drum um, in uh, solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Um, and I spoke to um, I feel like, again, like these aren't really my stories to tell and you read the stories, read the quotes from the dancers, click on the links, watch their dancing, watch their videos. Um, but I spoke to, you know, a group of um, ballroom Vogue dancers um, in Chicago who um, were kind of um, through voguing, kind of speaking to um, the importance of um, transgender people in the Black Lives Matter movement um, and kind of trying to recenter um, trans perspectives been pushed to the side. And um, anyway, I think that for me, that was a way of bringing attention to the 
joyousness, resilience, um, and also that that was kind of um, happening alongside this violence. And I also don't want to, one thing that came up in the story is that dance is not always a celebration. It's not always an expression of joy um, and that it can be a place to kind of release um, a lot of <laughs> incredibly, um, you know, like more uh, difficult and painful emotions and also a way of um, <clears throat> a kind of a uh, form of spiritual connection, a uh, form of prayer, a form of connecting to ancestors, depending on, you know, what your traditions are and where you're coming from, so. There's a lot of discussion going on here, Siobhan, that's so perfect. In New Orleans about um, the second lines, which are typically follow a funeral procession and include music and dance in the street. And the fact that people have not been able to celebrate uh, or give tribute to those who have died in that way has been very hard on the culture here. Mm. Yeah. Any of the other uh, panelists want to, to join in on, on this? Fergus, uh, yes. Maybe to like oh Toby, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um it's just it's just to add with what Shivan um, um said there that um um, because um, personally, my the my art form was created um, from such movement as such that is happening with the Black Lives Matter. Um, hip hip hop is is a is a is a pro is a is a protest and is a heavily involved in activist um, activists activist, Sorry, my word fails me. Um, activism. Yeah, there, there you go. And um, and yes, yeah, so so. Um, it's it's amazing to see that um, um, coming. Well, it, well, I won't I won't say amazing, but at the same time, it's just um, to see that come almost like full circle, whereby the art is still very much um, 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 used for um, um, for that. And um, well, in my circle, anyways, and 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 the um, and the pioneer of the, of the of the art form that actually created the art form um, um, took to the streets with the Black Light Movement um, up in New York. And um, and um, they had their lino out, and they 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 showcased um, 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 where where um, um, voice fills. They use their body to actually um, 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 almost touch touch the human heart where voice uh, where our voices or, or language fill to, and and um, and the response was very much well received. Um, um, yes, and 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 just to see that, and and to see that 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 art form and that art is still used in that way for me personally, kind of um, 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 touched a string in me that okay, yes, that um, the art form I've been um, I've been lucky enough and blessed enough to practice is still actually still keeping to the authenticity of the art form. So yeah, and 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 Siobhan saw it like uh, voguing. Um, um, is a street dance, um, is a street style. Um, you, there's no academic institute where you can go and learn voguing. It's still very much um, 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 a culture based um, standing for um, the LGBT and transgender community. Um, and, and, and dance is, is, and that art form is, is part of the street dance um, culture and is a culture that's still very much um, 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 used to actually speak where world feels. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just so important to recognize that many dance forms, as you're saying, have just always been a form of protest. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. exactly. And that's that's where they come from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Fargus. I, I was just going to say, I think it's important to address the kind of question or provocation that uh, Matt Goff has posed for us in the chat, um, which is asking around kind of uh, diversity and uh, in Ireland, and who gets to kind of shape the stories. Uh, one of the things that maybe uh, Matt asks, uh, do words fail because they reveal the issues we don't want to deal with? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm someone who's like committed to dance and to, and to movement. And I think I would have to own that that is probably something to do with my trajectory as someone who's come from a very uh, language heavy culture um, where verbal articulacy is the kind of currency 
that it felt to me the most radical thing to do was not to talk, but to, um, but to show up and to show up in relations with different people and to, to do that in different ways. So I, I want to say that I, I, like, I would argue that in our context in Ireland, that that is valuable or in particular context. But I, I, the thing that I'm uh, taking from Matt is, Matt's comment is, of course, there are important moments in, when to speak and to speak out and to and to and to reveal and to tell the truth Th those those are also important um i i just yeah i think I, I want to still hold on to the possibility that just the gathering of people already even before they make their kind of claim is a powerful uh, political um message um but uh, absolutely um, accept what Matt is articulating there and and what that might mean in Ireland what other stories what stories do we need to tell um I hope uh, those of you some of you will know that I I did work for 2016 around Roger Casement and um, one of the things that attracted me to Casement in that moment of thinking about how we defined our national identity was that he was someone who anti-colonialist um, international um, exposing human rights abuses in the Congo and in South America for indigenous communities in South America. So for me, it was very positive to imagine a story of kind of Irish foundational myth that was already connected with the experiences of other people. And I know that like the Easter Rising um, was looked to by um, equality, uh, um, black equality campaigners in America, African Americans, uh, Jamaican Americans, uh, and the Greys like Marcus Harvey, uh, as an example. So there, there are moments. There, there is experience for us that is solidarity, but we also have to own up that now, as a privileged white people, we pass. We we have the privilege of whiteness, so um, we have a history that we can draw on, but we also have a reality that we have to face. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, John, you wanted to uh, join in. Yes, Michael. Um, listening to everyone, thank you. The the contributions are so thought provoking and um, and and very inspiring. Um, one of the things that I thought about when I was asked about having the festival was um, who is Irish and who is allowed to be Irish, and I wanted to collaborate with American artists who have an Irish identity. I contacted Jean Butler last year, uh, Dara Carr, Sean Curran. Um, but um, then it was also very important to me to bring Mufatau Youssef, um, born in Nigeria, but raised in Ireland, living in a small village, Trim. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started, I think I was given the greatest gift in 2003 when I started working with survivors of torture at the at Spirazi, the Center for Survivors of Torture in Dublin. And I was working with people who maybe had been in Ireland for months or maybe a couple of years living in hostels. Um, and they, whatever was in their experience and whatever happened to us together in the room, which were therapy workshops, were turning into the greatest artistic experiences and workshops of my life. And it connected me, it made me feel more present, more real as a human being, as an artist, and also as an Irish person. Then simultaneously, the people I was working with were getting deportation orders. I ended up in the, in the immigration office, um, sitting with a couple of activists in case somebody, when they were getting their deportation order stamped, was going to be snatched away and taken upstairs. And I had this woman who had college students from UCD waiting to protest who knew how to lie in front of the place where the van opens to take people to the airport. And I thought, I'm a choreographer making a piece and I'm, what the hell is happening? And it wasn't horrible, it was horrible, but it was also something very beautiful and very real. And then when we have to fill out uh, immigration papers for Homeland Security to bring people to New York to get their work permits and they have to write their country of birth. And these people, maybe who I worked with, most of them are now Irish citizens, but uh, we go abroad, we travel and you arrive in the airport. And some of the people in my work are not pale with freckles and red hair. And they 
come out of the airport and people say, you're Irish. And um, I almost want to punch them every time. I think, what the hell? What the hell is your problem that you have to even question this? And who is allowed to be Irish? Morgan gets racist attacks because she is practicing an art form of Irish step dancing in America. And she is so gracious about it, so gracious. And um, I don't know how she can be with everything that's happening. And something I think is, it's in a way beautiful. I read this interview with Taneshi Coates a week or two ago of um, that there is maybe a chance for optimism now, despite the violence, despite the pandemic, despite these things about how we all universally have to define ourselves and, and well, the white privilege, but the right to be a citizen of wherever. Um, and that's one of the things that made the, the idea of an Irish dance festival and people who know me, my work has so many influences of the American postmodern, of, of German expressionism, of other European trends. I don't know. I never took an Irish step dancing class in my life, but I feel so Irish. And um, I'm losing my train now, but I've, I've kind of gushed enough. But there is something... Yes, it was the challenge to define Irishness or rather to destroy the concept of Irishness or to remake the concept of Irishness, as Fergus said, in an interdependent way that connects us all. And that we are now even talking in New Orleans, in Virginia, in New York, in London, in other places, and we're, we're sharing these things. Um, there is something deeper happening. And, and I am so proud to have a festival that... Um, it's not even that it's a festival, it's to show the differences, the differences and the similarities. I don't know what is Irish anymore. I, I don't think we can really decide what that is. This, is. this is about just opening it up. And because I have sat in deportation offices, I, I never forget that moment. I smell those offices. I smell solicitors' offices. I Google horrible things that happen in countries so that you can bring them to the lawyer so that that might help prevent a deportation. And I have never got over that. And it's, it's in my guts whenever I'm in the studio and it's in my guts when I'm planning this festival. And when people say some horrible racist thing to somebody because they don't look Irish enough. I, you know, I have a West British accent and a kind of an Anglo-Irish identity. And when I open my mouth, sometimes people say, you're not Irish, you're English or you're, you know, that's fine. I look fine. Um, my husband is Brazilian. Sometimes we get stopped at the airport and he just gets asked simple questions, but uh, because of, of that. And uh, I don't know. Yes, other people have been killed for that in other places. So we're lucky here, but um, I've had my explosion now, so I'll, I'll let you go, but I had to say that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I, and John, I don't know how we're doing for time, uh, John. Should we keep the discussion? I think you muted yourself. John, I think you muted yourself. I think you're still muted, John. There you go. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. We are a little over time, but I think we, um, Chris, can we keep going? Yeah, why not? <laughs> we have a certain, there's a certain window that the meeting is reserved for, but if people want to stay, I think we can keep going. Great. I just, oh. Can it? Yeah, Toby. Yeah. I just want to, um, the question that Michael, um, I mean, sorry, Matthew um, posed, in, in regards to um, seeing, um, especially the first body of the uh, of the message, whereby it's saying, um, especially after the white world, um, yeah. Um, but just to bring um, um, attention to that, because it's a very important um, 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 question, because because for me, I did not see the first um, the the first time I got interest in theater was when I saw Tabu Flow. Um, Dublin Dance Festival brought Tabu Flow. Um, they're, they're a group of, um, I think they're from um, Rwanda or Senegalese, Senegalese or um, I, 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 I can't quite remember. But, and they shared um, their, 
the artistry. Um, and there was a Q&A as well. And then, and then I saw John Scott piece, um, a piece as well and his work. And then, and then I saw Catherine Young. Um, and to be honest with you, those are the pieces that have inspired me because, because um, they touched a, a, a part of me that I've, that I've never been actually um, been allowed to be touched or almost like oxystride stage because um, um, it's the work is only for a uh, um, um, for kind of uh, certain kind of people and and um, and there's there's hundreds of like me here in Ireland um, 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 whereby they don't feel they don't feel as if um, um, there's enough work out there to portray the ethnic minorities, um, and I'm not, uh, yeah, and I'm not even talking only, only about um, um, black and um, um, colored skin. I'm talking about the traveler, um, the traveling community as well. Um, I, I haven't actually seen any work from traveling community, but having said that, there is actually a, a group of um, um, amazing um, 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 group from uh, Waterford, from the tra traveling community that that actually. Um, 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 make pieces um, um, for the for their community, but but I haven't said that. But basically, my idea, um, what I'm trying to say is that not until I saw those pieces on stage that I, as a black Irish um, 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 kid or adult or whatever, that's the only time I really identified with something, and something was um, 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 instilled in me. Um, because tr before that, I could not identify with anybody that was been on, that uh, that's been on stage or that is on stage or whatever they're trying to portray on stage. And it's very it's very important that um, the diversity um, 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 going forward, um, whereby um, 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 dance dance and performances uh, are for. Uh, are targeted at different um, um, demographics, not just not just a, um, um, a set of um, um, demographic um, um, people. Because if not for those pieces, I would not be the Toby I am today. If not for me seeing that per performance in Dublin Dance Festival of those um, six um, um, individuals that they brought down, um, or seeing John Scott pieces, or seeing um, 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 Catherine Young pieces. I would not, the Toby you see here would not be here today. Um, and, and, and just to end real quickly, because I have a, a, a 19 year old um, brother um, that was born in Ireland. And then again, there's hundreds of them. When they keep facing resent, resentment in every um, section or every section of society, um, 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 what, what happens is um, hunger, hunger and Hunger and um, hunger brews in them. Something, something destructive brew, start brewing in them. And by the time they get into society, all they know is been is been anger and resentment that they're gonna have to vent that out um, 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 somehow, in in some in some shape or form. And and most of the time it's gonna be destructive. If we look at the UK, there's uh, and, and and even in the states. I, I work in, in, in those communities where, where the, um, 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 yeah, I work in those communities. So, so I, I know firsthand and because I know if, even my, my brother of 19 year old now, there's something inside of him that is almost be like, I'm being rejected in my own country, you know? Um, Can I? Yeah. Uh, so, sorry. sorry, I, I, I no, no, I, no. I, <laughs> I think somebody yeah. was. So was, I, I, thank I, you. I, I want to thank you, Toby. I just want to expand on on a few things. I think firstly, just to to know that Toby is the first person who said Black Irish, and 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 up until then, the conversation has been African American. Um, I think that's really important in thinking about who we think is uh, what we think is an Irish body. That uh, my my comment about the Dublin Dance Festival, the the notion of asking where am I now in in the current climate being white and ableist, so being being white bodies and, and able bodies is incredibly problematic when we recognize the um, 
inequality that COVID has brought us. And, and Toby makes the really clear point. It's about bodies feeling welcome because they are spoken out towards. I feel, um, and it's my perception, I'm based in England, um, in Wales, actually, let's be more specific. I did my um, master's at the University of Limerick. I have a very close affinity to dance in Ireland. It, it means a lot to me. Um, uh, and it felt there was a silence from the dance community in terms of Black Lives Matter, which says we don't matter, that black lives and black dancers don't matter in the wider scheme. Um, and, and so, you know, Siobhan was really, was actually really articulate about this in terms of saying that actually it's about voices speaking for themselves, not voices being spoken about um, in terms of other people. So it's incredibly important that the choreographers, the teachers are diverse because they share a plurality of voice, that, that critics are diverse because they have different perspectives. And, and yes, there are things that we might not want to talk about because they're difficult, because they're uncomfortable, because actually, yes, many people deal with their daily trauma in a gracious way. And I think it's really important that actually those things are articulated. People feel valued as bodies. People's stories speak when you let them talk about their own experience outside of other frames. And that isn't always happening in dance. If it was, we would be looking at a much more diverse and equal dance sector. But that isn't what we look at. That isn't what we see. And so we have to acknowledge that actually not all those stories are being valued, that not all those stories are being allowed to be told. And we have to find ways and action beyond conversation to enable that to happen. Th thanks, Matt. Um, this format is, is difficult. I can't see if people are kind of raising an eyebrow or a hand to, to come in. So other panelists, I can't see you, um, but do I, 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 join in a few. Uh, sorry, was somebody speaking there? Yeah, it's Benjamin. Benjamin oh, speaking. Hi, Benji. <laughs> hi everyone and hi Matthew. I'm happy to represent Dublin Dance Festival as part of this panel discussion. And Matthew, I appreciate your uh, comment about this very this I mean this element of the program. And I feel you. I read you. Though I would say that you are commenting a very small element of the program of the festival and. Dublin Dance Festival is far from being perfect, though I have the feeling and I feel confident knowing that Laurie Uprichards is in the room. I feel confident saying that Dublin Dance Festival has a pretty diverse, eclectic and open mind program regard in, um, in comparison to some other festivals that are running, that are um, presenting, promoting, presenting some other art forms. Once again, I really appreciate the, um, the comments and we all have to make a lot of efforts and we will, though I would, I would defend a little bit the, the diversity and the eclectism of, of the festival as it stands for about 15 years now. And, but thank you for the comments, it's important. Okay, thank you, Benji. And I think Sheila wants to get in on a comment. Yeah, yes, I do. Thank you. And I really appreciate uh, Matt bringing this up. I think it's really important that we, we, we do address this today. And he's right, there hasn't been a, a very sort of proactive response to Black Lives Matter uh, from the dance community. Everybody is speaking their own voices. Um, and there's a, um, a real um, sense of urgency around this as well, just to reassure those who are not sort of based here, not feeling this every day, that, that there is a sense of urgency around that. And just from our perspective, I just wanted to just sort of say a couple of words on that, um, because I didn't want anybody thinking that we have not responded because um, it isn't um, important to us. And I wanted to sort of say a little bit about what Dance Ireland has been doing in, in this sort of um, respect. So, so we've been taking time to listen 
and to educate ourselves and to reflect on our own behaviors and actions because i think that's what we are all each of us called to do to be an ally or to be anti-racist or to really think about how we can support everybody to see and hear and feel those stories that they want to tell or they need to be telling we want to examine ourselves as an organization first before considering taking um, a position on behalf of the membership so in the midst of all of this activity in response to the pandemic, um, our recent change in leadership, I joined two months ago, it's been a, a, a very big time of change at Dance Ireland. And um, we want to take, and also wanting to take any actions that, any actions that we take to be consultative, to be authentic, to be embedded in our daily practice. Uh, we feel that it's best to be really considered in our response to the Black Lives Matter campaign and how we are ensuring we're addressing diversity, equality and inclusion in all that we do. So one of the things that we're looking at, we're exploring at the moment, is the idea of establishing a critical friends group. Um, the purpose of this group would be to draw together staff and board and sector representatives to engage in a process of critique um of our policies and procedures in terms of diversity equality inclusion and to in, un, undertake this we want to enge engage the support and input from leaders from black and minority ethnic communities deaf and disabled artists and representatives we know that the sector is looking to us for leadership right now but we want to do it right um and to reflect this in our values and to embed it in any of our future planning and activity and we're always open to um have this conversation and have this dialogue we want to change from the inside so we can represent everybody meaningfully okay thank you sheila uh any of the other uh, panelists want to uh join in on this um i'll just say Briefly, I'm, I'm not as embedded in the uh, scene of contemporary dance in Ireland, right? I'm based here in New York, but I think I really appreciate um, Matthew's comments and especially his comment about needing um, um, a greater diversity of perspectives among critics and historians. Um, right now, one thing I've been thinking a lot about is just the whiteness of dance criticism of which I'm a part <laughs> and, um, Thinking about, um, I feel very strongly that we need a greater diversity of perspectives in dance criticism. Um, people who can, are going to see different things, ask different questions, um, shape stories in a different way. And also artists um, speaking from their own experiences, writing from their own experiences. So I just wanted to kind of, I guess, recognize the importance of that, that um, aspect of your your comments and questions Matthew and thank you for bringing that into the space okay uh, thank you uh, anybody else want to join in on on that okay there was a, a question from um, some of the, the uh, Facebook comments uh, one of them here is a uh, person wondering how the panel would respond to uh, how they see the relationship between your work and the industries that support you. Uh, they say in the US where I work, there's a very bourgeois perception of who has access to work and also who can participate in it. Um, working within Irish traditions or pushing against them, do you feel this is similar? And if so, do you ever challenge this? How? Um, anybody want to, uh, to uh, comment on, on this? Jonah. Oh, no, sorry, you just popped up there. Yes, sorry about that, uh, Michael. It was just I had been going to comment on the previous um, discussion, but sure, that's yeah, fine. We've yes. moved on, so that's that's absolutely fine. No, 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 do, mean, do, do go on. I mean, really, all I wanted to, to say was that it, it, I think it's really um, important but also kind of interesting that this whole discussion um, um, in the panel today has actually really in as as we've gone through the various perspectives on the body that we've actually moved uh, I think through Shona's all... frozen again oh hopefully she'll come back am i back and... no, 
or unless that's me that's frozen. It's you, Michael. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can I... you hear me? Yeah, yeah, keep going. Okay. Um, I just, uh, what I think is that this um, panel okay. has approached the whole story of the bodies. And I'm so, um, I suppose, in a way, relieved <laughs> and excited by the fact that we have now moved into, I suppose, in a, a territory that brings us both into a new social, cultural, political arena within our, not just the dance community, but within the wider cultural and general public community about um, how we are looking at diversity and acting on it. So I was delighted to hear what Sheila Creedy had to say but from Dance Ireland. And, but I think Matthew's um, comments and just, you know, obviously require a, a bigger space and a more discussion um, at a further time. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And, and uh, people can probably see that uh, John has has said that himself. Uh, definitely, it's a it's a bigger discussion, as we said uh, earlier on. That that uh, as with all good discussions, it it should continue, um, and this this should only be the uh, be the the start of it. Um, is there anybody else that would like to from the the panel that would like to to join in? There is a group of artists in the oh. U.S that has formed a group and under the title Creating New Futures um, in response primarily to all the cancellations that happened and the power imbalance between the artists and the presenters. Again, <clears throat> um, most of the presenters being white and um, the artists just feel like they've got to step up and uh, speak out and I think it's been really useful. There's a long document that you can find on uh, Facebook under that page, Creating New Futures. And <clears throat> um, I think, I mean, a lot of us are, are participating in that and talking about how to change the contracting process with artists so that, the, you know, the fee doesn't wait until the very last minute and understanding the artists are, are working uh, up to a, a, an engagement prior to the engagement. So it's just been an interesting and very vocal group. There were 7,000 people on a Facebook call that Miguel Gutierrez and Unida Castro organized. It was pretty amazing. Thanks, Lori. Uh, Stephen Batts um, uh, from Derry has uh, sent a, a question and I don't know if you can see it but uh, he makes the, the point that how the body carries stories uh, to go back to the symposium title I have some issues but the or some issue with the language stroke conceptual assumptions I have a strong intuition that the language we use places hidden constraints on how we think and communicate and dance those issues uh, interesting anybody like to um, to to take that question up um that the language itself is a uh, is a constraining factor in in how we um dance and and communicate with the body am i going to have to volunteer somebody i i can speak about it <laughs> thank you Vargas. I, mean, I mean first of all there isn't the body there are many bodies um, and bodies are made in relation to other bodies. So that's one place where we let the language sort of, we, we maybe think in terms of a kind of abstract, but also universal body that doesn't take into account the fact that we all have different experiences of bodies and that's um, changed by our culture, our gender, our sexuality, all those sort of things. Um, so, in that respect. And I, I, I think I would agree because we often talk about dance as a language and I don't, uh, I don't think of it in those terms. I think there, there's a risk in thinking about dance as a language because then it's thought of in that kind of traditional ballet mind sense that I should be able to decode it in the same way that I understand a sentence. Um, now maybe it's a language more like poetry um, as in um, 
elements that we understand and recognize, but actually the um, the energy comes in a way from the space between the recognizable elements. That's what happens in poetry. It's it's not necessarily how it's the space between two words and how they resonate rather than a piece of prose that's telling you the cat sat on the mat. Um, so in that respect, maybe, and I don't know what, what Stephen has in mind, but in that respect, maybe I would agree that, um, but that's that's often the challenge. Like here we are speaking, we're not dancing now. So we've we're in the we're in the land of translation. So we're we're making the accommodations that we have to do in language because we're talking. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm fortunately I've been given uh, notice um, that we we uh, do need to wind things down. Um, John just have a, a final say. As always, John Scott has the final say. Um, but just to uh, to thank. Uh, first of all, the panelists, uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. And um, as I said in the very beginning, uh, to our conversation with any one of them uh, would have been fascinating. Unfortunately, we had to distill everything down into this um, this time. But it's it's I think it's really planted a seedbed uh, for discussion. Um, and I think John has, has already said that, you know, maybe this is something that we can uh, develop uh, during the week and and hopefully um, set a stage where we can um, further uh, discuss these issues. Uh, I also want to just thank uh, Conneth and Chris behind the scenes who've been uh, keeping everything running and got us set up and ready to go. Um, so finally, can I just hand over to John, who I think has a few parting words. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not muted. Yes, you can all hear me. Yep. So um, thank you, Michael, and thank you all the panelists. Um, really really great and thanks everyone else for coming uh the festival continues till friday tomorrow we have a class from Ash ashley shen at 10 a.m it's free you just go onto the dance island website and follow the link um and then in the evening at five o'clock there is a workshop on trunk stabilization and alignment from the amazing peggy gould and then cheryl therian and ashley shen are teaching in alterance all week at 10 a.m. And there are workshops from Faye Driscoll, Gesell Mason, and Rachel Shield. Uh, so then tomorrow night at 7.30, every night this week, there is a performance of short works by 30 choreographers. Um, so please tune in and, uh, and uh, thanks again, everyone. Good night. <laughs>